so much to this church. Many, many years she was our church secretary, and uh, my, I didn't think they would ever be able to replace her, and we haven't replaced her, but I do appreciate Sister Brenda is doing a great job uh, doing that same job, but there's only a very few people that uh, really uh, can handle that responsibility. But I appreciate all the many years of her service, and then, of course, um, the many years of um, making hot tamales so that we'd have this beautiful building here. Uh, and she was one of the key persons in, in making all of that happen. And uh, so tonight, I wanted to come and just share a testimony, because many of you uh, just think that she was always, you know, uh, Sister Bat. Always Sister Bat. I don't what direction she wants to go. I told them to take their liberty. And so, Sister Bat, just take your liberty and... Well, um, I was not raised in the church. I was born Catholic into a Catholic family, and I thought all that time that, you know, I was doing right. I went to catechism. I learned all that I needed to know. I went to church every Sunday, and I did what I was supposed to do, and I really thought I was doing good. Then I met Connie Babb. <laughs> I had never heard of Pentecostals before. I never knew what that was. But that was the faith that he was raised in. And he let me know that all the things I was doing was not the way the Bible said to do it. He said, you really need to read your Bible and, you know, you'll find out. And, of course, I didn't have a Bible we were not encouraged to read the Bible. They told us all we needed to know. We memorized our prayers. And for years, it was, I still remembered those prayers. I don't remember them now, but I memorized them. And so, you know, we started talking about marriage, and, um, and he told me, he said, I will never be a Catholic. And any children that we have, we will not be Catholic. So I said, well, you know, and he had brought me to some services with him while we were dating and some Sunday school services, and, and I liked it. You know, it was okay. So I thought, well, I can go to church with you. That's okay. And, you know, we did. And we started going to Sunday school after we married. We lived there where he was raised. And the pastor there um, was a very good teacher. He just... Everything just opened up. The word just came alive to me. I had never heard it that way. And it was like, okay, give me more, give me more. And I knew what I had to do. I knew, you know, everything I needed to do. His whole family lived for God. And I saw the examples every day. But we didn't go to church except to Sunday school because he had been in church, but he was... He was backslid at the time. So um, it wasn't too long after we were married, I went to a, a neighboring church with uh, his cousin who had been raised in it and went to the altar, and I prayed, and they told me I had the Holy Ghost. Well, I did have one bad vice. I did smoke. I, and to this day, it is hard for me to even realized that I did that. I did not drink. I did not, you know, go out. I was a homebody and still am. But after that night, you know, I thought, wow, I've got the Holy Ghost and, you know, but there was something that was not right because I didn't feel like I thought I was supposed to feel. And it wasn't long before I was smoking again. So I thought, you know, this, this isn't, this isn't right. Well, you know, the years went on, and we moved to Vinton. Connie started working in Orange, and his mother prayed for us for years. She prayed for us. She was very faithful to pray. She would come and see us. You know, Tony was a baby. She would come and see us, and she'd go to church by herself. And I know she was praying for us, but we never, we never really went. And one day... Um, it was in 1976. Tony was seven years old, and there was a knock on our door, and it was the new pastor to the church in Vinton. And he said, um, I just met your son down the road, and we'd like to pick him up tomorrow and bring him to Sunday school. 
So I said, well, um, what time is Sunday school? We'll bring him. <laughs> and it was not until later that we found out. He was very surprised when we walked, when we walked in the next morning because he said that didn't usually happen. <laughs> but, you know, God was, God was dealing with us and, and dealing with me anyway. And, and I knew that that was a thing to do. We needed to bring Tony to church. We needed to be in church. So um, we started going, and, and it wasn't too long that an evangelist came, and um, I, I went to the altar. I went to the altar several nights, and then one night I said, I've got it, I've got it. And they told me later, they said, you had it the first night. But because they knew of my first experience, they said, we were waiting for you to realize that, you know, God had to come down and hit you with a hammer in the head or whatever, you know. But I knew I had it. And from that day, God took the desire for cigarettes. I never wanted another one. I knew I had the Holy Ghost. And I knew what I was supposed to do. <clears throat> well, we got involved with Beth's ministry and Sunday school and all this. And and uh, God blessed us with our home, and I mean, it was just, it was just great living for God. And so, about a little over a year later, well, a lot of the men that Connie worked with, a lot of the millwrights were coming to this church, and we were invited to uh, some play or something. So, we kind of, you know, prayed about it, and we started coming here, and got involved with everything there was to get involved with, you know. We just, I was on the ladies' team, and, and I did, and Sunday school. I taught Sunday school, and that was my heartbeat. I wanted every child to know the Bible, because I had never, as a child, I had, I had to wait until I was an adult to start learning. God did all these things, you know, uh, Joseph, the coat of many colors. I had never heard all that. And so I put everything I had into Sunday school because I wanted these kids to learn. Amen. And God blessed us mightily. We were faithful to church, faithful to give of our money and our time. And Connie worked construction. So there were times when there was no job. And we had made commitments. And... We paid our commitments if we had to take it out of savings, and it wasn't because it was expected. We made a commitment, and we lived up to it. And God was faithful. If we prayed for a job, we got the job. There was, we, we never missed a note on our home. We never missed a note on anything. We never missed a meal because God supplied our every need. And, you know, time went on, Tony married, we had grandchildren. We had a little granddaughter, Cassie. Cassie was our life. She, you know, grandparents, there's nothing like a grandchild. She was rotten. We just did everything we could. And when she was about three years old, then Brandon came along, and uh, we spoiled him a little bit, too. But then came, then came a divorce, and it was pretty bitter. And through no fault of our own, we didn't have contact with our grandchildren. It was, it was just circumstances just made it best for us not to have contact with them. And that was the hardest thing in the world. God, you know, we thought, God, why? Why are you doing this? We've just been, you know, we've been faithful. We've done everything. Why is this happening? And, you know, we, I, I questioned. I, I couldn't help it. I thought, you know, what did I do to deserve this? Knowing that God doesn't do things that way. But this church prayed for us. We prayed, you know, and... I kept my face buried in the carpet, just cried a million tears, and I knew that God would work this out some way, somehow. We would see our grandchildren again someday. 
Well, in, in the meantime, Tony remarried, and now we have grandchildren again that we're spoiling, and we're teaching them the Word of God. They're coming to, to Sunday school. They're learning about God when they're little. And that, to me, is, is something that needs to be done. I, I mean, when you're a child, it's easier to learn. So um, we're just so proud of our grandchildren, proud of the way God has kept us. I mean, he could have taken my life before I had the Holy Ghost in a, in a boating accident. But, you know, I, I know it was because of Connie's mother praying. He, he, she, I wasn't saved, and she was praying, keep, keep her till she's saved. And so um, I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Nothing can touch me that God's not going to help me with. I, I know that he's there. I know that he's there when I, when I ask him for something. I, you know, when I pray for something, I know it's going to come. And it doesn't always come the day I want it. But um, this was one dark trial that we were going through, losing, you know, contact with our grandchildren and not seeing them raised. And, and we just kind of knew. We had encouraging words from services, preachers, the Bible. Just, you know, the church was, was praying with us. And... And it was like, okay, God, I know you're going to do it, but it's sure taking a long time. <laughs> and, you know, that scripture, um, Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in troubles. And I knew he was my strength then because, I mean, we kept coming to church. We kept doing like we were supposed to. Because we knew that if we were faithful to God, he would be faithful to us. Well, Cassie turned 18 in March, and I thought, God's going to do it. You know, I always was trying to think, well, how can I help God? You know, we, we got to see those grandkids. What can I do? But we had to stay away and let God do the work. And two weeks ago, Cassie called us. And it... it God just worked it out in a way that I never would have dreamed he would have done it. But it was, it was a miracle, really, because things just seemed like it was so against it. But now we have a chance to get to, to know our granddaughter and our grandson. That's going to work out. But I know that it's through faithfulness and, and, and God being there. That, that caused this miracle. This church prayed, and I am so grateful to have a church to stand behind. You know, whenever we have anything that we're going through, this church is very faithful to, to pray and to be with you. Pray for Sister Priscilla. She's having surgery in the morning, major surgery on her sinuses and everything. Then her and Brother Galen, they are, I have never asked them to do anything that they won't do it. I mean, it's the behind the scene thing. Go pick up people, do this and do that. Not anybody knows they're doing it. They just do it. Thank God. And she faithfully takes care of the custodian of the church. And so just send it. We're very proud of you. God's brought her from a long ways. Thank God. God bless you. I was raised Pentecostal all my life. Came to Pinehurst in 1993 with the rest of the family. Received the Holy Ghost for the first time 20 years ago this month 
The first three years, I rode the fence. I wanted to live for God. But I also enjoyed doing the worldly things, going to the clubs, cutting my hair, going out with guys that wanted no part of the church. Kept coming to church, but the next day, kept doing the same thing, doing things I know was not the right choice. But I kept coming anyway. I didn't want to worry to my dad because he called every time that I didn't come. I also hoped that one day I could change. I often cried and prayed, God, please don't come tonight. I'm not ready. (laughs) I had to sometimes work two jobs to support me and my, my babies. Thanks. My family has always been there for me. Julie and Charles pretty much have raised my uh, kids, Chris and Pat. Many times I prayed for God to help me, change me. I did not want to be lost. And he started working on me a little bit at a time. Every time I would go to cut my hair, no matter if I cut it with big scissors, little scissors, <laughs> it always kind of make you feel better if you do it with little scissors or <laughs> toenail clippers. And I even bro- broke it off with my hands, you know, because I didn't want you know, my hair to grow. But instantly, every time I did it, instantly I felt drained of the Holy Ghost. And I have not done any of that for 17 years now. And then it, he started working with me on how I was dressing. I, you know, wore shorts sometimes, pants a little bit. Um, and then it was the one-eyed devil. Borrowed one from somebody because I couldn't afford to buy one. So I had it for a couple days, and one morning I dropped the kids off at school, fell asleep on the living room floor watching a, um, just a game show. I thought I heard the front door open, and I tried to get up or raise up to see who walked in because I knew it was locked. And I couldn't raise my head. It felt like something that held my head down. And after a couple times, I finally jerked my head up, and no one was in the room. The front door was still shut, and I just kind of like passed it off like, oh, well, you know. But that night, I was in the bed sleeping with both of my kids. We had a window unit, and that window unit shut off by itself. And it woke me up whenever it did. And then the stereo that was unplugged came on by itself, and it started playing a song. And then this voice came on above that song, and it started saying the words to that song. And it didn't stop until that song ended. The stereo went back off, and the AC came back on. And then whenever it did that, the TV came to my mind. And I was like, oh, God, that thing's got to go, you know. And I was frozen with fear the rest of the night. The next day, I called Julie, and I told her what happened. She said, you need to get that TV out. She said, you need to get that TV out and get the house prayed over. And so uh, I brought that thing back and told him he could have it. I don't want it no more. And Julie and Sister Christy came and prayed over my home with all, and them spirits left. And then God started working with me about the man that was in my life at that time. I knew he was not the right one. He had a lot of issues, and I knew that God was going to give me someone that loved me for who I am and loved my kids like they were his own. I started praying about that situation tried to focus on me and my kids and God. I was tired of it. 
But during that time, me and Sister Kelly Goffman started coming to church and praying every day that we could. And we started reading, I started reading my Bible more. And one morning, we had an awesome prayer meeting. There was tongues that went forth, and it was just a mighty move of God. And it felt like I was face to face with God. And I told him all my problems, and I asked him, God, send me the man, a father to my kids that you have chosen for me. And I even wrote a letter to him, to God, telling him what I desired in a husband. And I put it in my Bible, and every day I began to thank him for him. And I started helping out in the van ministry, picking up children for Sunday school. Galen drove the van, and then that's how God started working on us. And we've been married for 13 years now. I couldn't ask for anybody better. He's a great husband, a wonderful father, and most of all, he always puts God first. Me and Galen has had our issues and our, you know, share of tests and trials. We have always encouraged each other in the Lord, and we have always turned to God for help when we were in need. I have found that the more you get involved, whether it's ministries, activities, and you stay involved, it helps you to get through your situations, and it's not so easy to give up. And if you are faithful to God, he will be faithful to you. His word has strengthened me many of times. I have scriptures written down at work, different places at home. I have a scripture on my icebox. It's next to my coffee pot that Sister Smith gave me at a ladies' meeting about a year ago. And recently I was going through something, and every night I would go to make the coffee pot, the scripture, Second uh, Chronicles 15 and 7. And in fact, it was in the bulletin, um, I think it was last week. It caught my eye, my eye every time, and I realized it was a word that I needed at that time. And I took a challenge about a year ago on sacrificial prayer time, and I started getting up early every day to pray. And I've had, I'm the type of person I've had, I, I have a very hard time getting up early. So sometimes I get lazy, but like Roseanne says, if I can get 10 minutes in, it helps you stay afloat. And I do feel like that it has brought me to a new dimension of prayer, and I want God to use me in doing whatever and however. My soul's desire is to be a soul winner. I used to be a lot shyer than I am now. I wouldn't even speak to people unless they spoke to me first. So now, so I know I have came a long ways. And I've made up my mind to please God no matter what. And I want my light to shine so people can see the one true God through me. How God answers prayer in the Babs' life, in uh, Sister Cindy's life. Thank God. And Mr. Dynam, praise God. I would like for Brother Fred and Brother Dale to bring the flags forward, and we have a minute of silence for 9-11. And these flags mean a lot to me, as I will tell you as I speak. And if we could just tell us when we've been quiet for a minute.
Well, there are some visitors here tonight, so I'd kind of like to introduce myself. My name is Diana Wagner. I've been coming to this church for about 20 years. And um, I knew, I, I'm like Sister Bab. I knew nothing about the Holy Ghost. I knew nothing about the Book of Acts or um, fasting or anything. And But God saved me. And within that Sunday that he saved me, he delivered me. Um, fill, uh, bat, I was baptized, and then um, I came back after Sunday school and got the Holy Ghost. And then um, that evening, um, the Lord laid a crushing, crushing burden on me for my, for my family. And, um, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about, because... Sometimes I think we kind of, not not all of you, I'm sure, but me, you know, we see older people, our neighbors, and sometimes, yeah, we'd like to get families in, and but, you know, there's people out there that are in their 70s and 80s that can be um, touched, and that one person I'm speaking tonight is about my mother. Um, she was Sister Perkins, and she went came to church here for about 10 years after God filled her with the Holy Ghost. But she did not give up without a fight. But I am just as hard-headed as my mother. And I would like to tell you how that all went down. When I married Dale, um, I'd never been to Texas in my life. So my parents were um, from California, and they lived in California. And I did not know how that um, I was going to witness to my mother so far away. I called her up and told her that I got the Holy Ghost and that I wasn't going to wear my pants anymore and I wasn't going to wear my nail polish anymore. And I had thrown it all away and she, and the trash man hadn't run yet. She said, could you mail it to me? <laughs> and I said, sure, I'll go ahead. So I went ahead and mailed it to her. Her day was coming. <laughs> and so... Um, then we found out a year later that mom and daddy were going to sell everything they had in California and move to Texas. And so they ended up living about 30 miles from here in Buna, in case there's somebody who doesn't know where Buna is. My mother always said Buna, but we kept trying to um, tell her it was Buna. <laughs> um, I, I witnessed to my mom and dad feverishly. I cried. I begged God. And... It just seemed like they were they they were just going to go to the Baptist church or die. They were not open to any other um, plan that God had. It was the Baptist church or no church. Well, every time my dad was um, um, disabled and 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 seriously bedridden by the time they had got to Texas, and uh, every time I'd brush up against him, I'd say, "God save him!" Hi, Daddy, how are you doing? God touch him, and uh, I, I it was crazy, but I was I, I, I what I had I wanted them to have, and so um, one day after they'd been in Texas for several years, we were on the front lawn, and I was talking to Dad, and he acted like he was seriously interested in what I had to say, and I was going to pray through praying through right there in his lawn chair. It, it, cars going by and Jesus touch him Lord God you can do it I know you can do it and he was under so much conviction but I thought I better back off well later on after mom moved in with us we were looking through our pictures and there was a picture of my dad at that time being rebaptized in the Baptist church I did not know it, but his conviction, that's where he, that's the direction it took. It broke my heart. So, um, the day of his funeral, um, we were going through, paying our respects, and I laid my hand on his chest, and it was hard as a rock. I th it was like somebody had poured cement in there. And I knew then, I knew then it was over. I had to get back on track. And I had to get with Mother and pray her through. So um, after, um, I have some notes. Just a minute, let me see where we are. <laughs> after Dad prayed through, she uh, got a job with my, uh, a good friend of mine, lived about three houses down. She was the um, 
CEO, for lack of a better word, of the DuPont Credit Union, and she had just had a baby. And um, I, um, she asked my mom if she would keep her baby. And it was really good for my mom because she had been in the house so long taking care of my dad that she really needed something to get out, but not something just totally in the job market that would just scare her to death. And uh, so she was, um, one moment. I would bring her to church, mother, every service. And if there was a new evangelist here that didn't know my mother, because when my dad died, she quit cutting her hair and she quit wearing her pants. So the preachers would come through and it looked like a seasoned saint sitting back there. And it wasn't. It was the devil. And I would go to that sermon. I would go to that evangelist and said, sir, my name is Dinah Wagner, and that is my mother back there. And I know she looks Pentecost, but she is not. She needs prayer. She needs you to go back there right now and pray her through. And they would. They would go back there and pray. But, it, you know, it, it just wasn't working. I would, in fact, I would get mad. Isn't that terrible? And so one day I said, well, this is it. I'm going to write her a letter. And I'm going to tell her that she needs to read Acts chapter 10. And I, and I, and I wrote it all out for her. And, and so I called her and I said, Mama, I said, I'm sending you a letter. And it's got a, some scriptures I want you to read. I want you to read them with an open mind, an open heart. And um, she said, okay. And um, she got the letter and and. I called her and said, well, did you get it? Yeah, I got it. I said, did you read Acts chapter 10? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? She said, I read Acts chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15. I said, whoa. I said, mother, I said, I cannot witness to you anymore. It is dragging me down, and it is just making me sad. And I said, I'm just going to pray for somebody else to send the truth to you because I, I can't do this anymore. Well, um, she got really, really sick. And, and that's why I wanted the moment of silence because when she had got really sick, it was on 9-11. It was 10 years ago. Oh, well, 11 years ago today. And um, she had a serious, serious kidney infection. It was so serious that the doctors said that they had not seen infections like hers except in third world countries. That's how serious it was. And um, they, they, they took her to the hospital, and I, I sat with her 10 and 12 hours a day. She was in the hospital for two months, and she lost 50 pounds. She was so sick. So... I, uh, they called the family in, and I was just crying all the way home, just crying. Dale said, you've already got her in the grave. And I said, no, no, I don't have her in the grave. I said, I am asking God for one more chance, one more chance to get the Holy Ghost. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I cried. So she got out of the hospital, and she could not go back to her house in Buda. She came to my house, and I knew that Mother was a good Baptist, very good. She didn't miss church. She loved church, but she had uh, uh, she was so sick and weak that she couldn't go to church. And I said, Mother, I said, I've got a plan. Why don't I get Brother Smith to come out and hold like a little church service? He has a little um, uh, book that he teaches from. It's about this big. It's called Search for Truth. And you can just sit in your comfort of your chair, and I'll even sit with you. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take this Bible study. Do you remember that, Brother Smith? And my girls got mad at me, and they said, Mama, you're trying to ambush Grandma. And I, I said, yeah, call it what it is. Or like Dale would say, it is what it is. Well, 
our, at our second lesson, Brother Smith came in with his little chart and has a little Bible. And and um, after our first lesson, Mother told me, said, she said, that's how our church teaches. And I said, it is. And so when Brother Smith, he sat down in the living room, I said, Brother Smith, I said, she t she's telling me this is how the Baptist church teaches, but I know it isn't because I was a Baptist for 21 years. This is not what they teach. And so Brother Smith did. He just put the chart away. He just started talking to her in love and compassion and ministering to her. So he left. And right then, um, it was about Thanksgiving time then. Well, it was Thanksgiving time because 9-11 was in September. And we all had dinner at our house. And um, my my um, sister-in-law's husband, he brought in some soundtracks he was going to sing. And um, Mother was kind of sitting, we were, we were sitting next to each other, and she was kind of behind me, and I was kind of watching him. And I could hear her. I could hear her trembling. I didn't turn around. It was such a beautiful thing, and I could hear her crying, trembling and crying. And I looked over. I didn't say, Mom, are you missing Daddy? Mom, are you sad because, you know, you've been so sick? I said, do you want to be baptized? She said, I sure do. So Brother Smith, he was in um, where yeah, De Quincey. We called him, and he raced in, and we raced to the church. And Mother Smith said, "Well, the baptistry is, is going to be uh, called." At that time, Mother had her kidney removed, and she had an open incision. I said, "Mom, it's going to it's going to be ice cold. I don't care." I, I, I said, "Mother, the water's not going to be sterile. I, I don't care." She just, I just, I just need to get baptized. I just need to get get baptized. So we baptized her in Jesus' name right up there. <laughs> and it was about two weeks later, right back there, right about where Sister Marie's sitting. She started speaking in tongues. <laughs> 78 years old. 78. And I'm... That's what I wanted. To, I wanted to share that. When Brother Smith asked me, I thought, you know what? It's time to give God glory. Amen. That was a miracle. Everybody in my family has been baptized in Jesus' name, except, of course, for my dad, has been baptized in Jesus' name and uh, have been filled with the Holy Ghost, not knowing anything about the Holy Ghost, not knowing anything about the book of Acts. And... Uh, I just thank Brother Smith for this opportunity to share this with you. And, and Sister Bab, that, that was a miracle. I'm so, uh, that was, how can I go up and say something trivial after hearing that good news? And Sister Junior Hair, I love it. Thank God. What a mighty God. He's brought us all from a long ways. There's not a one of us here tonight that couldn't tell where God brought us from. And it would be a miraculous thing because we are sinners saved by grace. Thank God. It is the grace of God. That it is.